couple of days ago, Chris the Author released a video about a great war that was raging on social media over whether or not little boys should be playing with cooking play sets for fear that this might turn them gay. Now, her video is fantastic. I'm going to tag her right here. You should go watch that and hear what she has to say. But as a biologist, I feel like I can add a slightly different perspective to this conversation. First of all, you cannot be turned gay. That makes no sense. We have mountains of evidence showing that this whole dialogue of being turned gay or worse, being straightened out, is harmful pseudoscientific gibberish that has no bearing in reality. But second of all, even if it did make sense, even if you could be turned gay, cooking is not a gay thing. It's a human thing. We've been doing it for over a million years. And if you're keeping track of the whole evolutionary timeline, that's well before our species even existed. It was one of our ancestors, another species of human, called Homo erectus. They were the ones that learned to control fire and started cooking meat. So this is a huge part of our evolutionary story. Anthropologically speaking, it's a massive part of all of our cultures. This is not a gay thing. It's a human thing. Let your kids be humans. But number three, even if cooking was a gay thing, even if that made sense, why would that matter? I remember the exact same argument a few years ago when Lucky Charms came out with a unicorn-shaped marshmallow and everybody lost their minds because these unicorns were so gay that they were going to turn kids gay because they spend every morning eating all the gayness. Even if this was a gay thing, why would it be a big deal that kids saw something gay? Why is it that every single time we have any depiction or any representation of homosexuality in any form, people are worried that we're pushing homosexuality on children? If this is really about pushing sexuality on children, where is the outrage over every heterosexual couple, every heterosexual relationship, every heterosexual romance, and every single form of media ever? Why aren't you mad about all the Disney princesses whose whole character arc is falling in love with a handsome prince? Why isn't that pushing the hetero agenda for you? Which brings me to number four. And this is going to sound like I'm trying to make a big gotcha moment. I'm really not. I mean this sincerely. We live in a bizarrely heteronormative society. Very few of us have the opportunity to be exposed to other sexualities, let alone question our own. If you really, really think that playing with a cooking playset or eating a marshmallow is enough to make you gay, I really hope that you allow yourself the opportunity to question yourself and your sexuality because you deserve to be happy and true to yourself. And if a marshmallow is enough to push you over the edge, I'll see you at Pride. This is a really common question. If abiogenesis could happen once, what's to stop it from happening again? Why don't we see new life every single time we open a jar of peanut butter or something? And it's because the environment necessary for life to come from non-living material is super duper nutrient rich and just absolutely perfect for all of these different organic molecules to fall together in just the right ways. It's not an uncommon scenario here on Earth. But the fact is that if a place like that existed here on Earth, it's very quickly going to be taken over by things that are already alive because it's just... It's too perfect. It's a wonderful place to live. Bacteria are going to swarm in there and gobble up everything good about that place well before new life could start. As far as how new life starts, that's half the point of astrobiology. As I've said in many videos about this, we have a tremendous amount of research about it, and if you had enough time, you could do it in a jar. So it's not a mystery. It's just not going to happen again anytime soon. The reason why their eyes are so shiny like that is because they have a special thing called a tapetum lucidum, which is a retroreflector that sits right behind the retina and shines light back out of the eyeballs. Now, why would that possibly be a good thing, right? Well, when you see things, light goes through your pupil, hits your retina, and gets absorbed by special photosensitive cells. That's what sends a signal to your brain saying, hey, I'm seeing a thing. But relatively, a very small amount of that light actually gets absorbed this way. A lot of it's just wasted, unless... 
you have that tapetum lucidum, which reflects it back and shines it back across those photosensitive cells again, so they have twice as much opportunity to actually absorb this light the way they're supposed to. And that's why those probably deer in this video have like super duper awesome night vision and why it looks like their eyes are headlamps in the middle of the night, which I just think is awesome. If you ever get the chance to dissect one of these eyeballs and see that tapetum lucidum up close, it's real shiny and iridescent and pearlescent and beautiful because it's such a good reflection and it's just awesome, dude. It's just one more thing that's so cool that other animals have that we don't have, and it's not fair. So I am currently deep in the heart of Texas, but I want to take a second to answer this question. It's a really good question. The term mitochondrial Eve refers to the fact that we all get our mitochondria from our mothers. Sperm cells do have mitochondria, but they're only in the tails. And when the sperm and the egg fuse, the tail falls off. And so at the end of the day, all the mitochondria in your body came from your mother's egg cell. Now, similarly, there is a Y chromosomal atom because Y chromosomes can only exist in sperm cells because why would an egg cell ever have one? So this kind of perpetuates this idea that we came from two people, a Y chromosomal atom and a mitochondrial Eve, but no, that's not accurate at all. In fact, genetic analysis shows that those two people would have lived about 100,000 years apart. So no, <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. And this is why scientists should really stop using things like poetry and mythology to try to make things make sense because while it is very pretty, it just ends up causing more confusion. Can someone please explain why America uses Fahrenheit and not clitoris? You know, sweetheart, I don't want to give you misinformation, but I think clitoris is that little boy that made me on PBS. He's talking about that kid, Kyle. The clitoris is that one day on December 25th, you give each other gifts and you celebrate the birth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. No, silly, that's Christmas. The clitoris is obviously that company that makes those facial care products, you know, to help prevent acne. Hey, Rin, huge fan. You're thinking of clean and clear, or maybe even Clinique. Clitoris is actually a very interesting carbon-carbon bond-forming chemical reaction between either two esters or an ester and another ketone that results in either a beta-ketoester or a beta-diketone. Come on, Jane. You're a chemist. You're better than that. That's Clayson condensation. Clitoris was that mega dump who sailed the ocean blue in 1492 to commit genocide. The most controversial shirt you own. For hard mode, make it not political and not about human rights. This one. This is my favorite t-shirt. And every single time that I make a video wearing it, without fail, I get at least one person in the comment section saying, Oh, so you question everything, but you still believe in evolution. But you still took the vaccine. But you still think that the Big Bang happened. Aren't you supposed to be a scientist? Some renegade you are. Questioning things is not the same as rejecting them. It is my job as a scientist and an educator to ask questions, not to assume that I already have the answers just based on intuition alone, or that everybody else who tells me something different, no matter how qualified they are, must be lying to me. That's the difference between scientists and conspiracy theorists, is that we ask questions too, but then we follow up with the whole thinking part afterwards. Why, on a molecular level, does friction exist? So it's really important to point out that a big part of friction is just the random bumps and irregularities between any two objects and how those can get caught and snag on each other. But you ask what's happening on a molecular level, and that's also really, really important. Because remember, those atoms and molecules are surrounded by electrons. And I mean that in the same way as saying that I'm covered in skin. The electrons are part of the atoms and molecules. And those electrons can form bonds the same way that they do with anything else ever. So when two things are squished together, you make these weak little bonds, and it takes energy to break those bonds, and that is what we know as friction. And that's also why static friction is stronger than kinetic friction, meaning if two things are stuck together and standing still, they have time to make these bonds, whereas if something is sliding, it's going to have a lower coefficient of friction because those bonds don't have time to be made. How cool is that? Can we talk about snails for a minute today, you guys? Do you think about them often? Because I do. Because they're great. Not only are they incredibly important for their ecosystems, because they're detritivores, they eat dead stuff and help clean things up a little bit, but they're also just fascinating. All of them can breathe through their skin. Some of them also have gills, 
and some of them even have lungs. And this immense diversity comes from the fact that you can find snails on every single continent on Earth, even Antarctica, and in the oceans. There are marine snails that live in salt water. There are freshwater snails. There are terrestrial snails. There is even a species called the volcano snail that makes its shell out of iron and lives around deep sea hydrothermal vents at temperatures exceeding 750 degrees Fahrenheit. They're just, they're good creatures doing good things. I'm proud of snails today, you guys. I hope you are too. Not only is it an evolutionary thing, because it protects you from eating rotten food and getting really sick. But there's a whole special part of your brain that is specifically dedicated to handling this problem. It's called the insula or the insular cortex. You can find it just by peeling apart your temporal and parietal lobes here. And you'll find this inner fold, this invagination of cerebrum, whose whole job is to make you feel sick to your stomach and to throw up when you eat or even think about eating rotten, nasty food. And what's really cool is it also activates when you think about rotten, nasty behavior. There's a reason why we say, ugh, that behavior just makes me sick to my stomach. It leaves a bad taste in my mouth when I see this, you know, incest, genocide, rape, murder, whatever. Oh, it just turns my stomach. It makes me ill. It's because the same part of your brain handles visceral disgust and moral disgust. How cool is that? If you'll indulge me, I'd like to share something with you that's very important to me. It's a thought experiment. And it goes like this. Think about your parents. You have two of them. Can you name both of them? Some people can and some people can't. What about your grandparents? You have four of them. Again, can you name them? Some people can, some people can't, it's whatever. What about your great grandparents? That's eight people. I think I can name two of mine. What about your great, great grandparents? That's 16 people. I couldn't even give you one of mine. What about your great-great-great-grandparents? That would be 32 people, every single one of which is very, very important to you. I mean, if even one of them didn't do their job, you wouldn't be here today. So, do you know any of their names? I don't know any of mine. And if you go back a little further and a little further and a little further, say 12 generations, that's 10 greats-grandparents, we're talking about over 4,000 people. If they all reproduced by the time they were around the age of 30, that would be somewhere in the mid 300 years ago. So 4,000 people who lived just after Plymouth Rock, I don't know a single one of their names. And they're all extremely important to me. And the more I think about that, the more that I realize I have no way of knowing if maybe some of my 4,000 people and some of your 4,000 people are the same people. And if that isn't convincing to you, how many generations back do you need to go before it is? Because just one more generation is 8,000 people, another one is 16,000, another one is 32,000. At a time when we only had a few hundred million people on the planet, we didn't have the billions that we had today, the more you think about just how big these numbers get and just how quickly they get there. And when you think about the fact that the distance in time between the first bow and arrow and the International Space Station is only around 12,000 years, you start to realize that this whole human story is your story, whether you like it or not. And you are a shaper in that story. Again, whether you like it or not. The more I think about this, the more I realize just how connected we are and just how dependent on each other we are. Because at the end of the day, we're all we've got. And as pedantic as that may sound, I take that really fucking seriously. And I hope you do too. I hope you think about this today. And I hope that it reminds you to be kind to your fellow Earthlings. Have a good day. Bye-bye.